Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the International Centre for Sustainable Carbon. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, sustainable-carbon.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organizations can download our reports at no charge after one-off registration on the website. Please type any questions you might have in the question, questions box as we go along and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. The subject for today's webinar is the global status of bioenergy with carbon capture, or BEX, presented by Dr. Jenny Jones. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. This um, webinar is summarising a report we're currently writing, uh, myself and my co-authors, Leilani Darvell and Bichel Goodka on the global status of bioenergy with carbon capture or, and storage, or BEX. So I hope in this presentation to answer several questions. What, what is BEX and why do we need it? How much is there? Where is it happening? I'll just briefly talk about two case studies and then talk about an important point of how much is sustainable, how much BEX can be done sustainably and then briefly discuss some of the barriers and challenges before some concluding remarks. So what is BEX? Why do we need it? So this slide captures some of the principles around BEX um, and the figure at the bottom shows quite nice demonstration of it. Um, so we have um, CO2 capture from biomass as it grows through photosynthesis and if that biomass is used, it releases the CO2 back to the atmosphere and we get the short term terrestrial carbon cycle. Fossil fuels, of course, belong to the ultra long term carbon cycle. So if they emit carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it takes many millennia for that to be sequestered back. So if you can displace fossil CO2 with sustainable biomass CO2, you effectively reduce in the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere so it contributes less to our remaining carbon budget to keep us on track for uh, keeping global warming below one and a half degrees C. Um, if we then combine that emitted CO2 with capture of the CO2, we can have negative emissions from our, our plant and we begin to decrease levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. It can be applied to many sectors and our report mainly focuses on power generation and energy from waste and some combined heat and power. And there is an example or two from heavy industry. And of course, bioethanol is the sector where, where BEX has been um, commercially deployed to date. Um, so we do mention that. Um, but it can be used in other sectors. It can be used uh, in a biorefinery for hydrogen production, chemicals or fuels, and also in anaerobic digestion for biogas production. So there's three main approaches to BEX. The most um, commercial approach is post-combustion capture, shown on the left here, where we burn our biomass um, in air and capture the C take the flue gas through the absorber unit. The CO2 binds with the solvent, usually amine based. Uh, it then passes to a stripper unit, which uses heat to separate out the CO2 from the combustion project product. So we have a CO2 rich um, stream from the stripper unit, which is ready for compression and transportation and storage. This, is provide, this has a big energy penalty associated with this stripper unit. Another approach is uh, on the right here, pre-combustion decarbonization, where you have a gasifier and you use oxygen and biomass and a, a shift reaction to produce a hydro, rich hydrogen CO2 stream, a separation of those gases, and again, uh, capture of the CO2. And then the third approach is in the middle, oxy fuel combustion, 
where you have an air separation unit, uh, you burn in your biomass in oxygen with some recycled flue gas. And after cleaning, then your flue gas is no longer diluted with nitrogen because you're using oxygen. So you have a rich CO2 rich stream ready for capture and compression. So why, what is the case for BEX? Why do we need it? This graph on the right shows projected um, pathways for greenhouse gas emission reduction. It's come from the, climate, the latest climate action tracker based on the national determined contributions of the various countries that have signed the Paris Agreement. So it's what, they're, what these countries have committed to do. Um, so the top light blue line shows the pathway we would have um, with the current policies and actions that have been um, legislated. And that would get us to between two and a half and 2.9 degrees C. This is from um, integrated assessment modeling of different scenarios. Um, if we consider just people's 2030 targets, um, then that would be the red line would take us to uh, the pathway would lead us to around 2.4 degrees C. And if we now include all the pledges and targets to 2050, then it takes us on this light blue trajectory with a global warming average of about 2.1 degrees C. And then the dark blue line is the optimistic scenario. So this is if, if countries had uh, managed to reduce their emissions more than their targets, or, or if some other countries were able to decarbonize faster. So the optimistic scenario puts us on 1.8 degrees C. So we're still, a, um, we still have a gap from the green uh, pathway, which is the one and a half degrees C consistent pathway, which means we have by 2030, this ambition emission gap um, of about 19 to 23 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So to bring us from our 2030 um, current trajectory to the one and a half degree C consistent trajectory, we have this large emission gap, emission gap, 19 to 23 gigatons of CO2. So it's really looking essential now that we firstly um, increase our national determined contributions if possible, uh, make, start accelerating our reduction, but also implement carbon removal technologies. Um, and BEX is the most advanced and economic uh, carbon dioxide removal technology available. So hopefully you can see that sustainable BEX is pivotal in this immediate term as part of the solution to bridge this emissions gap. So how much BEX is there and where is it happening? So the table at the top shows some of the current BEX installations. The answer is not very much. Uh, not very much is happening. This is just showing the power and energy from waste and also one in the cement industry. So the five um, BEX facilities that are op operational or operational are operating are in Norway at their Norsem cement plant, which is using 30% biomass as a fuel. And it uses post combustion capture uh, aiming technology for capturing uh, 0.4 megatons of CO2 per year. Uh, this is this doesn't store it isn't stored at the moment, but there is planning for that to happen in the Northern Light site, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, Japan has two um, demonstrations, one um, at an energy from waste plant using post combustion capture and that CO2 is used in algae cultivation and the other at the Mikawa power plant, which has been demonstrated at the 0 0.003 megaton CO2 per year scale, which is actually the largest demonstration in power production. Again, no storage yet. And then in the UK, we have Drax Power Station, which has a pilot scale post-combustion capture 
and again no storage yet and then in the Netherlands an energy from waste plant capturing 0 0.06 megatons CO2 per year currently used um, to enhance the CO2 in the atmosphere in greenhouses. There is more in the pipeline. In the next five years, this could increase tenfold if these projects go ahead. Um, and obviously, we need the transport and storage infrastructure to actually store the CO2 emissions. Um, so the Norway Havsland Olsio Celsius, I'll show that in a moment. It's, point, it's an energy from waste plant, 0.4 megatons per year of CO2 and post combustion capture uh, should be completed at some point this year. And another energy from waste in the Netherlands also due for completion this year, 0.1 megatons per year. Um, in Sweden in 2025, uh, energy from waste CHP at 0.8 megatons per year, again using post-combustion capture. And then Drax power station in the UK is planning to add BEX at commercial scale on one unit at four megatons per year by 2027. So sorry, if those if those projects come online, we would have had a tenfold increase in the in those five years but we're still a long way from contributing to the, um, gig the gigaton scale emission gap. So I just want to show a few countries, obviously there's a lot more detail in the report and just talk about what the status of those countries. So I haven't mentioned USA yet. Uh, the USA is actually a global leader in calm capture utilization and storage and it has over 50% of the commercial facilities. And most of that CO2 is coming from fossil power, natural gas processing, fertilizer production, and hydrogen. But it's also coming from bioethanol plants because the US is the biggest producer of bioethanol globally. And the map here is taken from the IEA website um, and it, the, it shows a part of the US. And the black lines show the CO2 transportation pipelines. The grey hashed areas are areas of potential storage for CO2. And then the orange um, shaded areas are areas of large CO2 emissions. So they're the industrialized areas. Um, so most of this CO2 that's uh, being captured at the moment is transported through pipeline and it's got a 25 megatons per year capacity at the moment but most of that is used in enhanced oil recovery so even from the bioethanol plant it's probably not carbon negative because it's producing bioethanol which of course emits co2 when it's used and it's also um, used in enhanced oil recovery so we've got more Fossil, fossil production happening. Um, four sites in the US have progressed to detailed appraisal for storage and prompted by the tax credits in the US, the 45Q tax credits and also uh, President Biden's clean energy future plan. Um, there are now uh, various expansions happening or being discussed about linking more bioethanol uh, plants to a network, mostly in the Midwest and South USA. But it's a really complex process. It's bringing together a lot of partners. There's negotiations with landowners for bringing pipeline, which would be hundreds of miles through uh, different land, who owns that, who maintains it. And then also there's negotiating around the monitoring and of the storage sites and so on. So it is a complex process. There are other areas in the US where there's opportunities for BEX. Uh, there, is, there are dedicated biomass plant and there is some co-firing in the US. So there's potential there, but there's also the, the very large pulp and paper sector, sector, which has opportunity for about 150 megatons of CO2 per year from that sector that could potentially um, 
be worth exploring for backs. So Europe and the UK are probably leading in the development of BECs globally. Uh, we have a commitment for neutrality, carbon neutrality by 2050. And Europe and the UK are definitely progressing through the cluster and hub route. So these are sites of high industrial activity and probably some big point source emitters um, that form a cluster that will benefit from a network of CO2 ca uh, capture and, and, and transportation to hubs for storage. So some of those are shown on this map on the right. Uh, we've got the region in Scandinavia here, um, which is developing quite fast for BEX projects and other CCS projects um, with the the CO2 being stored in the um, Northern Lights project. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it's the it's at the off the coast of Norway. That's the grey circle. It's got the arrow pointing to it. It's a decoupled site, so it would be decoupled capture of CO2 and shipping of the CO2 to that storage site. And the Norsem cement plant I mentioned is one of the first ones that will be benefiting from that uh, Northern Light storage and constructions underway. The clusters around the UK, there's several. Um, there's Net Zero Teesside, Humber Net Zero, both part of the East Coast supercluster. And there's High Net Northwest. There's also the Scottish cluster, and uh, the Scottish cluster is um, on the reserve list for funding from the next phase of um, government innovate funding. Whereas I think uh, Net Zero Teesside and Humber Net Zero have uh, are able to bid for money from this innovate funding and and HiNet has also been granted some projects through that. I want to mention China. It's, uh, there isn't BEX activity in China at the moment, but it's worth mentioning because it's the world's largest CO2 emitter and its emissions of greenhouse gases dwarf those from Europe. Uh, it's still got 80% of its primary energy from coal, but it's also uh, leads the way on renewables as well, with over a thousand gigawatts of renewables. But it hasn't yet peaked in its CO2 emissions. It has committed that that peak will happen before 2030 and that it would reach carbon neutrality by 2060. This is a formidable undertaking. It's already, from power alone, its emissions are 47 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So to start to um, deliver on this commitment, uh, there's a lot of five-year plans uh, coming out. The next five-year plan is that it will include calm capture and storage as an essential pillar. And we're seeing the, a number, a large number of demonstration projects uh, beginning to develop. And there'll be the development of hubs, hubs and clusters as well. China's also providing tax incentives for biomass co-firing with agricultural residues. So that area is really expanding. And we're seeing some of the ministries starting to include BECs in their planning to try and meet this uh, commitment. And the research evidence is that BECs is going to be required to reach this deeper decarbonisation required by 2060. So this may be an area where BEX develops rapidly in the coming decades. So I think in this section, the conclusion is that while we have some small demonstrations of BEX, it's not integrated. We haven't yet demonstrated an integrated system for power that takes bioenergy, calm capture, and then transportation and storage right through to deployment. Certainly there's none at large commercial scale. And our 
current um, status of BEX is really around 0.5 megatons per year of CO2 and very little of that is permanently stored. That's in the power sector and heavy industry. So just some case studies. Uh, just quickly, I mentioned this Havsland Oslo Celsio Energy from Waste Plant in Norway. It's a 100 megawatt CHP plant in Oslo. And it's the second site that would take advantage of storage in this Northern Light storage site. So it's the dotted lines in red shown on the map. Uh, so the CO2 from the North Sem cement plant and the Havsland Oslo Celsio plant, which was formerly known as Fortnum Olso Varme. So those two sites are the first two sites targeted for storage in the, nor in the Northern Light storage site. So at that plant, CCS feasibility began in 2015 and pilot scale operation in 2019. It uses amine technology, the shell can solve technology, and it's now scaling up and full scale operation is planned for 2026, 27. You can see the time scale for development of these BEX projects is of the order of 10 years. So we really need these projects coming through now if they're going to be able to roll up and scale up fast enough. Uh, the cost was a, is estimated to be around a billion euro. And um, some of that's come from the Norwegian government, some from Havsland also Celsio, and some from the uh, Oslo local government as well. The second case study that we have a, a lot more detail in our report is the Drax power station in the UK. This uh, was originally a coal power station. It has six, 60, six, six, 60 megawatt units and it began co-firing biomass in 2003 at a small amount. And this was prompted by the renewable obligation credit incentives to encourage decarbonisation of the coal power stations in the UK. This was followed by piloting direct injection of biomass into the coal burners at a level of 10%. That was piloted in 2005. And then in 2010, it was rolled out onto all the units, uh, all six units and investment in rail transport and biomass storage alongside that to cope with more biomass uh, being stored on site. Drax also began uh, sourcing and developing their pellet supply chain. And then from 2013 to 2018, for between that period, four of the six units were fully converted to using wood pellets, and that required uh, further investment in the storage domes that are used to store the pellets, um, the train stock and the port infrastructure for receipt of the, the pellets and storage at the port and so on. So the figure on the right shows the uh, increase in biomass use from 2008 to 2021 and the associated carbon reductions. Drax is now planning to um, demonstrate BEX. It began this in 2019 when it started to trial the Sea Capture, which is a Leeds based spin out company from Leeds University, um, trialed that on uh, one of the units. In 2020, it also trialed the Mitsubishi Heavy Industry Calm Capture, and it's now decided to go ahead with the MHI Calm Capture process for one of its units. So it's now begun the feed, the front end engineering design, and the consultations for rolling out BEX onto one of its units by 2027, and the second unit by 2030. If that happens, then it, the decarbonisation would be eight megatons per year, and the UK would actually exceed its 2030 target for greenhouse gas engineered removals. 
but I, from that you can see the length of time again it takes to go from the pilot scale through to commercial scale so again we've really got this decisive decade ahead if we want this first of a kind demonstration at scale it needs to be supported through that commercialization process if these projects come online they'll provide valuable data and experience to help decrease costs help decrease risks so that there can be further investment further learning as we roll out uh, to get the sort of removals we need so the big question how much bex is sustainable so the intergovernmental panel on climate change um, did a, a lot of modeling on on uh, reaching our climate targets uh, using integrated assessment modeling and their mean values for co2 removal by bex is 10 gigatons per year providing 200 exajoules of primary energy and in fact 67 percent of their scenarios have between 2 and 10 gigaton co2 per year removed by bex by 2050 and bex contributing to more than 20 percent of primary energy by the end of the decade this of course implies the significant land and water requirements as well as other other land associated issues so it's prompted a lot of controversy and a lot of debate around what is sustainable on the left there there's two of the pathways from the IPCC scenarios and in P3 we have the pathway for reducing emissions to get to the levels we need at the moment our emissions are around 40 gigatons of co2 a year um, so we need carbon reductions which are reductions in the amount of fossil co2 that's shown in gray and we need to bring in other technologies brown here is something we haven't talked about in this talk but it's um, agriculture forestry and other land use and the carbon savings that can produce and yellow is bex so in p3 it's the middle of the road um, we bring in we we reduce our use from now onwards should be coming down globally and we bring in bex um, a bit later you know towards the mid 2030s and and the yellow area shows how much bex we need to bring our to get our negative emissions um, p4 assumes that we would continue increasing our co2 emissions globally for a bit longer uh, it's more energy intensive so we're using a lot more fossil for longer um, we'd bring in becks earlier and we'd need a lot more in order to get the carbon savings we need to keep us to limit global warming to one and a half degrees c now we're probably somewhere between these scenarios at present because our co2 emissions are still increasing globally and actually these two pathways require or the assess the research suggests that it requires between 6.7 and 53 percent of global cropland if if we chose to do all the becks with energy crops that's how much cropland we would need obviously we that we wouldn't do that but if we did it just illustrates how much cropland you'd need so of course there are lots there is lots of debate and with good reason on um, rolling out BEX on its impact on land uses societal impacts and actually how much carbon it actually saves which is a really important point as well uh, the other thing to note is that P4 which you which really relies on BEX to meet our targets uh, it, there's a high risk in assuming that we can roll out this much BEX to provide our negative emission solutions. So we really need to be reducing emissions and using the carbon dioxide removal technologies as well. So if we think about how much is sustainable, there's been a lot of research in this area now, and there's general consensus that it's around the 100 exajoules per year mark which is around two to four gigatons of CO2 per year from BEX. And the range depends on how you use the BEX. Is it for power? Is it for industry? Is it for transport and so on? And what percentage of each? 
Um, and one example is the IEA's net zero roadmap, which the figure on the right is taken from. And it shows how, how biomass contributes in the different sectors between now and 2050. In their scenario, uh, their lead scenario, I suppose, um, they have global land area increasing from 330 mega hectares to 410 mega hectares by 2050. But they put a, a big emphasis on using woody based energy crops and resources, as well as waste streams, so biogenic waste streams. And in their scenario, forest resources would be 270 mega hectares, which is 25% of global managed forests. And that's about 5% of global forest. Uh, 130 mega hectares of land used for short rotation woody energy crops. And then 10 mega hectares of land used for conventional bioenergy crops. So that's the crops grown for transport fuels, for example. And then a big input from biogenic waste streams. They also stress in this report how important it is to have a governance over that biomass supply chain. You really need strong certification and governance over where the biomass is coming from, what land is used for bioenergy purposes, to try and make sure we don't have all these issues, which I'll come on to in a moment, around um, other competing uses for the land, biodiversity, water use, fertilizers, etc. So I think there's general consensus that sustainable BECs is about 100 exajoules per year and two to four gigatons CO2 per year removal. But there is this emphasis around governance of the supply chain and certification. And not just those issues I've mentioned, but also to make sure you're getting the carbon savings that you're anticipating. So what about barriers and challenges for BECS deployment? So one way of thinking about the sustainability of the BEC supply chain is thinking about the carbon efficiency of that supply chain. And of course, we're using BECs because we want to generate power, but we want to save carbon. So we, want, so we need both. And this figure on the right is just illustrative, showing carbon flows. It's from some nice work by Fajardi and um, Niall McDowell, showing um, if you had a one tonne of CO2 in biomass coming into a power station, where are the losses? And at the moment, they've assumed zero losses for land use change. I'll come on to that in a moment. But you can see there's different processes. There's the cultivation of the crop, processing it, transporting it, the actual Bex plant itself, all use carbon. So your actual net negative emissions are going to be lower depending upon this supply chain. Land use change is another really important one. So if you change a land from one type of biomass to another, there's the possibility of releasing carbon from the soil and there'll be a carbon payback period for that carbon to be resequestered in the soil. And sometimes this can be several decades and sometimes just a few years. So it's very important that that land use change is considered and we need this detailed life cycle analysis to understand that. So things that affect the BEC supply chains are things like land use change, water use, fertilizer use, emissions during collection, densification, transportation, and the amount and, and level of that is all dependent upon the type of biomass, where it's grown, how it's processed, how it's harvested, how it's transported. And then, of course, there are issues to do with sustainable development goals as well, because this biomass might be being produced in uh, developing countries and shipped elsewhere. There's potential impacts on increasing demand for food, loss of biodiversity and impacts on other resources. And even there's an, even uncertainties around the potential impact on the energy balance, the climate energy balance, if you start changing land use. So from this large body of research, it's quite clear that there's still a lot of uncertainty in this area. And we really need detailed life cycle analysis. And we need to be 
optimizing every step of that supply chain to improve the carbon and of course the energy efficiency. Um, yeah. The other, another barrier is the technology readiness level and commercialization. This uh, figure, I know the text is a bit small, but it attempts to capture where each of the different developing technologies for carbon capture and, and of separation of CO2, where they're at. And it just shows the highest level of TRL indicated for each type of technology. And moving technologies from even pilot plant uh, well, certainly from pilot plant to commercial is a really costly and high risk process. So at present, there's no specific policy for BECS and, and there's no real um, specific financing incentives to move BECS through the TRL levels to commercial. So this is an area that um, is a barrier. Um, and also the fact that we haven't got these commercial scale projects to prove the technology and to provide the data necessary for further development of BECs. So um, both the uh, financing incentives and also the, um, the scaling up to commercial are really important to, decrease, to begin to decrease costs and technical risks and to attract finance for further rollout. There are other barriers and challenges. I've just tried to capture a few on this slide. The one of the most important one is the CO2 transport storage and infrastructure. Without that, BEX won't happen. So I think this is a um, um, should be a major national and international um, uh, development to start to allow us to decrease carbon emissions, not just from biomass, but from fossil as well. There are technical challenges. I've listed some of them here. Certainly improving CO2 capture efficiencies and lowering the cost and reducing the energy penalty of the capture systems. There's also question marks around how some of these uh, current commercial technologies will behave when using biomass, which might have different contaminants in the flue gases to those that uh, we have experience on from coal flue gases. There's also issues around the some of the um, solvent based technologies around thermal degradation and um, corrosion issues and emissions of amines using those solvents. As I've hinted at, I think a big challenge uh, is really the a good, strong policy and economic um, measures in place to regulate and encourage the deployment of BECs. Also, on the BECs supply chain, we need the governance of that supply chain and carbon accounting. And then, yeah, incentives to not just attract uh, investments, not just the capital grants, but also measures to ensure that the operational costs are also economic. I think for BECS, there's also the challenge uh, around public perception, a big challenge. Uh, all, the, all the issues that arise with CCS also apply to BECS. And as we know, there has actually been a lot of misconceptions and sensationalism about the bioenergy supply chain. So we really need a lot of education there, addressing the misconceptions, backed up by good evidence on carbon accounting. And another really important point, because there are so many uncertainties in that supply chain, um, the best practice for the BEC supply chains has to evolve and adapt over time as we gain more research evidence and as we gain more experience. So there needs to be a mechanism for those policies to be it and, and uh, incentives to be iterative and always promote best practice. So concluding remarks, um, 
BEX is a pivotal technology in climate change mitigation strategies. We've seen that carbon dioxide removal technologies are going to be important to bridge this emissions gap. And sustainable BEX is estimated at the two to four gigaton CO2 per year mark. And, and it's probably now essential for meeting even the two degrees C climate target. There are um, barriers to its implementation, costs, the fact that the technology hasn't yet been demonstrated at commercial scale, the lack of CO2 transport and storage infrastructure, how this is managed and how the incentives are managed when you know the supply chain spans continents often um, and the storage might be in another country as well so how how do you manage that and you really need strong policies and governance to help this deployment and support the deployment at the moment bex is only demonstrated at less than 0.5 megaton CO2 per year, that's without storage, but that could increase tenfold in the next five years if these projects come online. And it, it would need to acceler accelerate considerably after that. And yeah, we have these few projects in the pipeline, they would be really vital. They are vital for proving the technology uh, so that the BEX rollout could continue and accelerate and that we need the strong government policies, incentives and governance to deliver this rapid acceleration in deployment, including transport and storage. So the way forward, um, the research shows that if we want to stay within our remaining carbon bu budget for how much more greenhouse gases we can put into the atmosphere and limit global warming, if we don't have carbon dioxide, dioxide removal technologies, it's going to be much more difficult and more expensive. There's a, the challenge for decarbonisation is formidable and the deployment and needs to be accelerated in all sectors and we also need reductions to be accelerated as well, as well as removal. The other technology, uh, engineered technology for calm dioxide removal is direct air capture. Um, BEX has, the big advantage of BEX is that it gives calm dioxide removal as well as energy. And as I've said, it's the most commercially ready technology at the moment for carbon dioxide removal and the most economic. The DAX is expensive, it's unlikely to be commercial before 2043. This is from the Global CCS Institute 2022 report. And some of the main barriers for BEX relate to the same barriers for calm capture and storage generally. That is the geological storage and transport infrastructure development and making sure that happens and the regional collaborations that have to happen and a supportive policy and regulatory framework. But for BEX, there's also specific barriers to do with the supply chain. And it really needs incentives that value biogenic carbon removal. That's it, thank you for listening. And I'll have a look at the questions. <laughs> Okay. Okay, there's a question around once BEX is fully deployed, will there be a limit to how much CO2 can be stored? Um, there's certainly research going on in that area. I must admit our report um, ended at the capture part, so we didn't really review that literature. Um, but in, in terms of BEX, I would say at this point, that was not a problem if the storage sites are, are developed. Um, I think the first, I think I read that the long, the long ship project in the first phase of development would be one and a half gigatons of CO2. Um, 
but some of the sites are obviously can be developed to be much larger than that. But as I say, that's outside the remit of this report, so I can't really answer fully on that. Don't know if my colleagues, if you want to add anything, please step in. <laughs> on the unmuted. Oh, oh, sorry, go on. Sorry, go on. Okay. okay. There's a question on There's oxygen question combustion. On oxy combustion. combustion. And what is the meaning uh, is of the meaning R E E twenty twenty? I think that's the reference that we got it from. I'd have to look. I'll I'll I can email you the answer to that. I'll look up the the reference for that unless either of my colleagues know off the top of their heads. Unmuted. No, sorry. No. So I'll, sorry. I'll, so I'll, I'll email I'll, you that one. Okay. How will Bex be incentivized? How will the costs be covered? I have got some. Um, I have got another slide I can show you on some of the policies that have been uh, put in place um, for CCS, which could be shared. Or back. So let me just, or the incentives, let me just um, move along to that slide. Sorry, uh, this was policies. Yeah, hopefully you can see that okay. These are some of the um, incentives that have been um, suggested for CCS or used for CCS. Um, I think the from discussions with beneficiaries, I think they would like to see incentives for renewable power as well as incentives for biogenic carbon. So two types of two types of incentives. I think a lot of the funding would be uh, would have to be public funding initially. Um, and then probably the uh, tax credit, uh, via tax credits and um, capital grants. And then the carbon tax could provide a market. But I don't think, from what I've read, I don't think it should be wholly reliable on the on the carbon tax. Anything um, to add from my colleagues? Jenny, I would... Unmuted. You hear me? You yeah. hear me? Yeah. 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 I think we lost Bichel. I think we lost Bichel. Can you hear me now? Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would add that obviously because there is two different, there are different parts of the process that do need to be incentivized. And as we say that, um, like the biomass could be grown in a different country compared to like where it is going to be used for back. So we also need to think about how um, who is going to be incentivized for the biomass, the growing of the biomass, or who is going to be incentivized for, like, you know, using the biomass? So I think that comes into play as well in this case. Thank you. Um, There's a question here around the pulp and paper industry with CCS and whether that could truly be considered as BECs. I don't know, Leilani, if you want to comment on that or whether we I'm come back, it. whether we come back to it, to it. I think we'll come back to that, Jenny. All right, we'll come back All to right. that one. We'll come back to that one. 
There's a question about storage, which I can't answer. We, we haven't covered storage in this report. So uh, it's about whether the CO2 remains in liquid form. I can't answer that. And a question around the slow development of BECs. Is the rate of deployment described in the pathway for mitigation scenario realistic? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, I hope that we wouldn't be at that extreme. It, it really does require an over-reliance on, on BECs and other carbon dioxide removal strategies. So um, I think we need more reductions happening and faster so that we need less BECs and less other carbon, carbon dioxide removal approaches. So the spin out of renewables and uh, displacing, you know, offsetting fossil emissions, I think that has to happen faster so that we don't, we're not over reliant on BECs. I think there's a danger that that could happen. Okay, there's a question about the economics of BECs at Drax Station. Uh, given that they import their fuel and will have to transport the CO2, is it fair to assume they are on the upper end of costs? I don't think I've seen anything published around their estimates of costs. So I don't think I can comment on that question. Apologies. And that's the end of our questions that are in the question box. So I think there's just one to get back to on. One was the reference and one was on the pulp and paper industry. So I think if we follow that up with emails. Oh, I'm seeing some more now. Hang on. Oh, asking if they receive the slides. I'll, I'll ask my organisers to comment on that one. Yeah, they'll be um, available after the website. Oh, uh, no, on our website after this webinar, shortly after. OK, thanks. And I think this full report is coming out some before April or sometime around April. Uh, there's a question upon on the commercial CCS projects being used for enhanced oil recovery and whether they have any climate benefits. Thanks um, for that question. Um, it was something I really wanted to do a lot more research into, but I ran out of time on. Um, I do know that even the there's one large project that is sequestering um, the CO2. And even that project isn't carbon neutral uh, or isn't net negative because it's using, this is a bioethanol with CCS, it's using a fossil along the way and also it's producing ethanol, which, which is used in petrol, of course. So then it's burned and you're releasing that carbon. So that carbon isn't saved. So you've already got less carbon being sequestered because it's being utilised for ethanol production and also the fossil in the in the chain. So even that one isn't net negative. Oh, a question about converting tankers for shipping CO2. Uh, can existing ships be economically used or converted or do these need to be purpose built ships? Again, we didn't do the transport and storage in this report. It was just around the um, the supply chain, the global status and the technologies um, with some case studies. So I can't answer that. I know Bijal looked a little bit into shipping, but I don't know if she looked at whether the tankers can be converted for CO2. So I'll just see if she's got any comment to make. No, I didn't go as deep into saying if we can um, convert ships to convert like ships into tankers. So unfortunately, I can't comment on that. OK. I think that's oh. all we've got time yeah. for. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the questions.
Thank you so much, Jenny. And uh, as I said earlier, the slides from this webinar will be allowed, available to download from the webinar page shortly. Um, and all that's left for me to say is the next webinar from us will be on the 22nd of February and it will be presented by Greg Kelso. Thank you all for joining us.